Now, Pastor Robert's been teaching on freedom, free indeed, and I'm just going to piggyback right on top of actually where he ended off last week. And this message is called A Mindset Free. And I want to talk about freedom from mental bondage and making sure that our, our thoughts are free. I ask you to turn to 2 Corinthians 10 and stay there if you would. But let me read you just a portion of John chapter 19, which is interesting. It says, And Jesus, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. It's interesting that Jesus was crucified on a hill that looks like a human skull. If you've ever been to Israel, you can stand on the Temple Mount and look north, and you can see it. It's right there. And the first time I was there, about 30 years ago, I remember just looking at it, and it just looks just like a human skull. It could have looked like a foot. It could have looked like an elbow. It could have looked like anything. But if you would have been there on the day that Jesus was crucified, you would have seen a cross on the top of a human skull. See, Jesus didn't just come to give us eternal life. He came to give us victorious life. And even though you might be saved and on your way to heaven, you can live a life of complete bondage because you're only as free as your mind is. Satan in Genesis 3 took mankind captive. He didn't take us captive with a gun, a bomb, a knife, or anything like that. He took us captive with a lie. And the first words that Satan said to mankind were, has God surely said. Before the devil defeats you, he has to disarm you. And God had given Adam and Eve his word. He had given them his commission. And the first thing that the devil did to attack Mankind was to call into question the integrity of God's Word. And once he had disarmed them, he defeated them. And Jesus came as the incarnate Word of God to defeat Satan, to take the curse away from us, to give us the gift of eternal life, and to give us back the truth that would set us free. And that's exactly what he did. And on the cross, the portrayal of Christ's death when they pierced him in the side, the blood and water flowed on the top of a hill in the shape of a human skull. Jesus came to set our minds free. Jesus came to make every area of our lives successful. And Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, this message is called A Mindset Free. I have a little booklet. It's in all the bookstores and all the campuses. It's also on our website, marriageday.com. It's a little booklet that goes along with this message. So once this message is over, if you want to get that booklet, it'll help you in some areas that I'm going to mention. But I want to talk about freedom in our minds, and I want to talk about three issues, important issues, about being free in our thoughts. Number one is understanding the mind as the main battlefield of good and evil. When we talk about spiritual warfare, when we talk about, you know, engaging an enemy, and Jesus referred to Satan as the enemy many times, we have an enemy, he's going to attack us, but the main battlefield that we're going to battle the devil on is the battlefield of our thoughts. Second Corinthians 10, where I ask you to turn there, it says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Paul says here we're in a war, and we're in a war against thoughts, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Any thought you don't take captive will take you captive. And any thought that you have not taken captive has you captive. And what the Apostle Paul says here is we're in a warfare, but it's not a warfare of the flesh. It's a warfare of the Spirit, and we're pulling down thoughts. A bondage is a house of thoughts. If you have fear, if you have depression, if you have lust, if you have anger, if you have addictions, a bondage is a house of thoughts. The problem isn't the substance, it's the way you think about the substance. The problem isn't the circumstance, it's the way you think about the circumstance. The problem isn't your past, it's the way you think about your past. A bondage is a house of thoughts. And the Apostle Paul says, we're taking every thought spear point. That's what the word captive means. We're taking every thought in our minds. There is no rogue thought in our minds if we're going to live free. 
every thought in our minds, we're going to put a spear against it and make it listen under Christ. It says to the obedience of Christ. The word obedience there is the Greek word hupakoe. It means to listen under. Every thought that comes into our mind, we put the spear point to it and make it listen to what Jesus has to say. And that's how you live your life free. So a bondage is a house of thoughts. The strongholds, the arguments that the Apostle Paul is talking about are those areas of our lives that the devil has introduced thoughts to us, whether we knew it or not, that are not consistent with the truth of God's Word. And that's how he takes us captive is through those strongholds. Well, when I got saved at 19 years old, I smoked. I started smoking in high school. We used to, I ran track. We used to go into the foam room where I was a high jumper, and we used to go in the foam room and smoke. That was a real good way to work out for track. And so that's how I started smoking. I started smoking actually at baseball practice one day, but uh, so I, I started smoking, and so I got saved at 19 years old, and I smoked Marlboros. I mean, I, was, I smoked, and I didn't know it was wrong. You know, I mean, I used to have my quiet time. I would wake up, drink coffee, pray, have four or five cigarettes. I thought that was great, you know, and I didn't, I didn't know any better. So the Lord called me to preach, and one day I was praying, smoking, and the Lord said to me, he said, uh, I can't do what I want to in your life with you smoking. And I thought, well, okay, you know, I, that makes sense. And so I tried to stop smoking. I tried everything I could think of, every trick you can think of to stop smoking. I tried it. I couldn't stop. I just, and, and it was really discouraging. And so one, one day I was having a quiet time smoking, of course, and um, I told the Lord, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I can't quit. I've tried everything. And the Lord said to me, from this point forward, every time you're tempted to smoke, say this, I'm a non-smoker. And put that thought in your mind and meditate on that thought. I'm a non-smoker. Well, I was smoking when he said it. I thought, well, so I put the cigarette out and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to stop smoking today. So I went to work and, okay, the guys at work that I worked with, a lot of them smoked. And so the day before I was at work smoking. So this day I showed up at work not smoking. Now, all of you know that around people that smoke, and when you try it, they always walk up and say, you need a cigarette? Because it makes them nervous that you're not smoking. So they walked up. All day long they walked up and said, you need a cigarette? And I said, I'm a non-smoker. I said, you smoked yesterday. (laughs) Well, today I'm a non-smoker. That's how I stopped smoking. Now listen to me. I saw myself as a smoker. I didn't know that, but I just, I couldn't see myself not smoking. But in my mother's womb, God did not make me as a smoker. So what God was saying to me is, I want you to see yourself the way I see you. And as soon as you do, the nicotine isn't the issue. It's the way you think about yourself. And every time I was tempted to smoke, I said, I'm a non-smoker. And I would lay in bed at night saying, I'm a non-smoker. I, I'm a non-smoker. You know, I, I'm not, it, because I was tempted to smoke. And what happened in the process of meditating upon that was it changed my mind about who I was. And I stopped smoking. And today, I can't stand the smell of smoke. I never think about smoking. Because I'm the person today that God made me in my mother's womb to be. And the problem wasn't nicotine, it was a thought, a toxic thought, a rogue thought, a stronghold, an argument that had to be pulled down. You cannot solve a spiritual problem with your flesh. When you're trying to use your flesh to overcome your thoughts, you're fighting the wrong enemy with the wrong weapon, and you're going to lose. We are the gatekeepers of our minds. The devil doesn't decide what I think, and God doesn't decide what I think. I decide what I think. And for me to be set free, I've got to come to the point of understanding my mind is the battlefield the devil wants to fight me on. And for me to be uh, victorious, the first thing I have to do is make Jesus the Lord of my thoughts. James 4, 7 says, submit to God, then resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Without submitting to God, we don't have a chance of defeating the devil. But once we submit to God, we have every chance of defeating the devil. So I have to let God, Jesus Christ is going to decide the thoughts that stay in my mind. 
I'm going to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Number one, this is the battlefield. Number two point is understanding the Word of God is a spiritual weapon. The Word of God is a powerful spiritual weapon beyond anything really that we can understand. This is Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul again. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Now he's going to tell us specifically what that armor is. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. He tells us to be strong in the Lord. He doesn't say be strong in ourselves. He says be strong in the Lord. And then he tells us how to do it. He says put on the full armor of God. Put on, and he's using a Roman soldier now as, as the analogy here. Put on the full armor of God. And then he tells us what it is. Let me tell you the six elements of the armor of God because they're all truth. Everything he's telling us to put on is a thought, okay? He says, gird your loins with the truth. Well, a Roman soldier would put a belt around his loins, and that belt is where he hung the sword, okay? If you didn't have a belt on, you had no place for your sword. It says, so gird your loins with truth. Well, the interesting thing about this part of our body is this is where we reproduce and eliminate. When you're living your life based on God's Word, you reproduce truth and eliminate error. When you do not live your life based on God's Word, you reproduce error and eliminate truth. So the Bible says make a decision that you're going to use the Word of God as the basis of which you reproduce in your life and what you eliminate in your life. If it doesn't match the Word of God, it's out of here. If it matches the Word of God, I'm going to receive it and teach it to other people. I'm going to multiply truth and eliminate error. It says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. This is another truth. And that truth, see, this is your vital organs. If you're looking for a kill shot in war, you go right here because that's the heart, okay? So you're going to try the kill shot. The breastplate of righteousness is this. The devil is always going to try to rob you of your joy in Jesus and your faith by condemnation. He's going to tell you you're no good. You've done too much wrong. God loves other people more than he loves you. And the blood of Jesus can kind of maybe barely get you to heaven, but God's still a little ticked. You better watch out. The breastplate of righteousness says this. The blood of Jesus is the strongest cleansing agent in the universe. And when my sin touched that blood, it's gone forever. And I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And every time... And every time, devil, you remind me of my sins, I'm going to praise Jesus for his blood. I'm going to punish you. Every time you try to condemn me, I'm going to rub your nose in the glory of Jesus and his blood. I put on the breastplate of righteousness. It is not my righteousness, it's his. I put on the helmet of salvation. That means I think saved thoughts. I'm a saved person. My mind is protected with thinking the way that God wants me to think. My feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel and peace. And the thing about a Roman soldier's sandals is they had cleats on them. They could, they could fight an enemy going uphill and make up ground. My life is not about making money. My life is not about pleasing myself. My life is not about fame and fortune. My life is about glorifying the God who saved me and takes me to heaven. My life is about propagating the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is a purpose worth living for. And the devil wants to take, that, take those shoes off my feet and get, let me live for money or live for pleasure or live for all of that so I can live a worthless life. But I wake up every day and I remind myself the reason I'm alive and taking a breath is because of the God that I serve. And I will not allow a purpose so small in my life that it's anything less than the gospel of Jesus Christ. I take up the shield of faith, and this shield was not this little hubcap shield, it was a full body shield. It was portable. You could protect any area of your body with it. I have faith that I'm saved. I have faith that I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I have faith in the truth, and I have faith in the gospel. Though it's foolishness to some, it's the power of God and salvation with me. I put faith. 
and I take up the sword of the Spirit. This is nuclear. Jesus Christ was attacked by Satan himself in Matthew chapter 4. He hadn't eaten in 40 days. He had no energy left in his body. The devil attacked him personally, and Jesus defeated him by quoting three scriptures. This is nuclear in the realm of the Spirit. This is nuclear. This can, this can defeat the devil on your worst day. You can quote this, and you can defeat the devil himself. And this is the full armor of God. It's, it's more powerful than anything that we can understand. But here's what God wants you to do every day when you wake up. Truth, 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 truth. It's all truth. It's all the way we think. It's all the way we think. And when your thoughts are right, you're ready to engage the devil. One other scripture related to the power of the Word of God, and this is Hebrews 4, and I know you know this scripture, but this is Hebrews 4, incredible scripture. The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to him who we must give an account. For the Word of God is living and powerful. You read other books, this book reads you. The devil has a great interest in this gathering dust on your coffee table. Because what he understands is this, when you read the Word of God, it comes in and it's living and alive. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. This can tell the difference between your soul and spirit. And there's no creature that can hide from this. If there's any enemy of God, if there's any demonic stronghold, I know you're not demonic, I'm saying, but if there's a a work of Satan in our lives, it can't hide from this. This is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. You know why it's sharper than any two-edged sword? Because when it comes into your life, it does two things. It finds the enemy and slays him, and it finds your wounds and heals them like a scalpel. This is a healer and a killer. It'll kill the bad things and heal the good things. Psalm 107, 20 says, God sent his word to heal them and to deliver them from all of their destructions. This is the weapon that you're going to win every battle with in your mind. Number three point is understanding biblical meditation and spiritual warfare. This is so incredibly powerful. Psalm 1, such a powerful promise here. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. Now, what, what a promise here that if you meditate in the Word of God, everything you do will prosper. And when I read this, when I started thinking about this many years ago, I thought, that's too hard and I can't do that. It's the easiest thing in the world. When you're meditating on Scripture, it'll be the most pleasant, peaceful life you've ever lived, and you can do it right now. It's easy, and I'm going to teach you how. The word meditate means ruminate. It they're like a sheep has five stomachs, and when they, when they eat, they swallow, regurgitate, swallow, regurgitate, swallow, regurgitate, and it purifies it until finally it's digested. That's what this word means. It means to murmur to yourself. It means to bring back up, to, to regurgitate. And so meditation, and this is not Eastern meditation or New Age, this is biblical meditation, okay, is meditation is simply reading Scripture, putting it down into your heart, and then bringing it up at certain times during the day. That's what it is. And so let me talk about just the the practice here, and that is, see, there's hardware and software. If you're a a computer person, you understand there's hardware and there's software. The hardware is the machine, and the software is just the program that that is designed for the machine. Well, we have brilliant hardware. Your brain is the hardware. It's it's brilliant. There'll there'll never be a computer made that can rival the human brain. The human brain is, is brilliant but we have infected software. We're born with infected software. There's something wrong with the program. And the reason the Bible says that uh, if we meditate on the Word of God that everything we do will prosper is this. Meditation, this is the software that our brain was designed to run on. This is what the devil stole from us when he attacked us in Genesis 3. 
This is what he wants to steal from us as he builds strongholds in our minds that keep us from the knowledge of God. But the Word of God reprograms our brain. When you're meditating on the Word, you're literally downloading the software that reprograms your brain to think and act properly. And it also has a built-in virus removal program. So, when you're meditating on the Scripture, all you're doing is taking a te- text of Scripture, and it needs to be practical. Let me, let me say this. When you wake up tomorrow morning, you've got issues. You know you've got issues. Okay? I've got issues. Well, don't we have issues? You find a Scripture that matches your issue. Okay? Read what you need. Don't make it religious. Don't, you know, don't, don't go to Leviticus when you're dealing with, you know, something. <laughs> Lord, there's nothing wrong with Leviticus, but I, I'm not attacking your word as I'm preaching on it. But, you know, read what you need. And so in the little book that, that I wrote called Mindset Free, I give a lot of scriptures as examples. For example, if you're dealing with condemnation, Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? You meditate on that. You put that in your spirit and you meditate on it. Okay? Is uh, fear, 2 Timothy 1.7, or Psalm 91 is also very powerful. Fear. There, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. You put that in your spirit. You attack a spirit of fear with, this is, it's wonderful. This is a thick book, and it talks about everything. Anything that I'm going through, there's a scripture in here, or maybe it's just something that I want to learn. I'm going to meditate on a scripture. You know, I want God to reveal something to me. I, I want God to speak to me. So I'm meditating on a certain scripture. So I'm going to wake up in the morning, and I'm going to read what I need, and I'm going to bring it up and meditate on it four times during the day. Here are the four times of the day that your mind is going to come under attack. Deuteronomy 6. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. And here's the four times when God said, teach your children the word of God. When they're going to bed at night, when they're waking up in the morning, when they're sitting around the house, and when they're traveling somewhere, when they're on their way. Here are the four most meditative times of your day. When you're lying in bed at night, when you're lying in bed in the morning, when you're sitting around the house not doing anything, and when you're traveling somewhere, okay? And those are the four times the devil will attack your mind. You'll notice when you're busy, typically, that's not when you struggle. When you struggle the most with your thoughts is when you wake up in the middle of the night, right? And you're laying there in the middle of the night, and here comes the thoughts, here comes the worry, here comes the lust, here comes the fear, here comes whatever it is. And you're laying there. And when you have a scripture in your heart ready to bring back up, you're armed and dangerous, and the devil knows it. You can defeat him instantly. But when you don't have a scripture in your spirit, your thoughts are not as powerful as the devil's thoughts. He'll clean your clock. But God's thoughts are more powerful than the devil's thoughts. The Word of God can defeat the devil every time. Now listen to me. You cannot take a thought out of your mind you can only replace it with a more powerful thought. So I'm sitting here right now, I say, don't think about a pink elephant. Don't think about it. Don't think about a pink elephant. Stop it. I'm going to tell Pastor Robert. Everybody's thinking about a pink elephant. The more I tell you not to do it, the more you're doing it. Blue frog. Blue frog. Now you're thinking about a blue frog. You forgot about that pink elephant. You see... The devil comes with fear. I can't get that thought out of my head. And when I battle it with my thoughts, I just end up waking up the next morning being worn out, right? At the end of the day, I just feel like I'm under siege. I'm just worn out. But the devil comes against me with condemnation, and immediately I wake up and I'm feeling condemned, and I say, no, no, no. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, as weak as it was through my flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of flesh, devil. You come against me with condemnation, I'm coming against you with Scripture. You come against me with fear, I'm coming against you with Scripture. I've got my spirit loaded and I'm ready for a fight. When I'm, when I'm in my car, when I'm in the plane, when I'm, when I'm sitting around the house, when I'm laying in bed, that's when the devil will come with a thought against me. And biblical meditation means I have loaded in my spirit Scripture, and I will bring it up during the day in those contemplative moments, 
either when I'm not doing anything and I just need to be thinking about something godly or in those times when I'm under, under attack. We're the gatekeepers of our minds. The devil doesn't decide what we think. God doesn't decide what we think. We decide what we think. When I was a young man, I'll close with this story. When, when I was a young man, got married at 19, a week before we got married, Karen told me she wouldn't marry me. Um, I was very immoral. I, from the time I was 11 or 12 years old, pornography was passed around our neighborhood by neighbor boys. And uh, that, was, that was all of my understanding about sex was based on that type of thing. And I'd given my life to Christ a week before we got married. We got married, but I dealt with lust. And I just, I didn't know how to deal with it. I, and it, I couldn't overcome it. And, um, but I was a Christian. I went to church. Uh, God had called me into the ministry. I couldn't overcome it. We went on vacation one year to a place, and I noticed a book on biblical meditation on the coffee table, and I thought, well, you know, biblical meditation, I, I don't know what that's about. And it was about, by a college professor. And, I, and so I thought, you know, I don't know about that. So I picked it up, and, and I just was reading just the very beginning of the book, and this college professor was telling the story of how he sold pornography <laughs> as a boy to the neighbor boys. I thought, well, I can relate to that. College president, a a Bible president, a Bible college president. So he's telling his testimony about how he tried everything to be set free from lust, and the only thing he could ever find was biblical meditation. And his little book that's now out of print is talked about how to meditate upon the Scripture. I had tried for years to be set free from lust. That day, I was set free from lust. It doesn't take five minutes. Meditating on Scripture is instant. It instantly sets you free. That's how powerful it is. I have a friend who's a West Point graduate um, who is the most disciplined human being I've ever met in my life. He called me one day, and he said, Jimmy, he said, I I need to come see you. So he came to see me, and he walked in in my office, and he he was just defeated. I mean, he just, and he said, he, he walked in and said, you know how disciplined I am. And I said, you're the most disciplined person I know. He said, I'm addicted to pornography, and I I can't deal with it. And he said, I've tried every single thing I know to get set free from this, and I just don't know what else to do. And I said, I want to talk to you about something. And in about five minutes, I taught him how to meditate on Scripture, how to get a Scripture in his spirit. And every time he was tempted with lust and pornography to begin to meditate on it, he went home, he called me several days later, and he said, I'm free. I said, really? He said, Jimmy, I'm 100% free. He said, when I left your office that day, I went home and I began to do that. He said, I haven't struggled ever since. And he said, the devil still attacks me. He said, I am amazed at how simple it was. And I didn't even understand that as a believer, how to do that. I'm saying to you, you can live your life free from fear, free from depression, free free from thoughts of suicide, free from low self-esteem free from condemnation, free from lust, free from addictions. The battleground is here. This is the weapon, and biblical meditation is the process. Let me pray with you about your heads, if you would. We declare you Lord of our thoughts, Jesus. We bring every thought captive to you, and we declare war on every stronghold of the enemy in our lives. We dedicate ourselves to living according to your word. We gird our loins with truth today. Father, I'm praying for my brothers and sisters that are dealing with strongholds right now. In the name of Jesus, I declare their freedom. In the name of Jesus, we bind Satan and all of his evil work. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would come in your power and that you would snap these chains right now and we walk out of this place free. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. Good being with you. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. 
but we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I am so proud of you.